a look at the book, The Ultimate Book of Space. And it's by Annie Sophie Bauman and Oliver Lake Took. And um, I think this book is really interesting and cool in a lot of different ways. I don't know if we're going to read everything about it or everything in it, but there's definitely some really cool parts here. So our starry sky it says, on beautiful cloudless summer nights, look at the sky and be prepared to be amazed. The earth is an immense rotating observatory. Here the moon, there the stars, over there is a planet and everywhere the Milky Way. What a sight. So it's got constellations, they're groups of stars that form shapes of things such as animals, people, and even a microscope. There are 88 different constellations that can be seen from all over Earth. So, um, and it takes about 10 minutes for your eyes to adjust to the dark night sky. And then you'll be able to clearly observe the celestial bodies and the stars. So, you know, you could, it says trace an imaginary line so we could see the, the Big Dipper because that's how, that's how the constellations are. It's like connecting those stars. Okay, so we, we can see those stars with small telescopes, uh, binoculars, naked eye. Um, this is a reflecting telescope with a large telescope in an observatory. So there's an observatory dome then. It opens up and then people are able to look in the sky. And then um, here is the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, while the Gemini Observatory is in Hawaii and Chile. So we have um, other observatories like that one. I saw one in Hawaii when I was on top of Mount Haleakala in, Ma on Ma in Maui. And um, I'm gonna show you, go, go ahead and show you that picture. Isn't that cool? I mean, these are real life things. So we're just looking at some different um, images here. So the moon is a celestial body that orbits the earth as its satellite, the sun illuminates it. And the Milky Way is made up of billions of brightly shining stars. So space travel, astronauts are often um, scientists who already know how to pilot an aircraft to go to space, they must train for at least eight years. They learn to withstand the extreme conditions of space, and they need to know how to deal with any situation and problem that might arise. So they do lots of different training here. So um, at space, it says in Earth, we are held to the ground by gravity in space. This is not the case. Instead, we fall continuously toward Earth, which gives the impression of floating um, you know, it takes, get some time to get used to. So, um, you know, it says the boat, blah, 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 I can't speak. The body floats in water as if there's no gravity to simulate the conditions of space. Astronauts sometimes work underwater in a pod. Astronauts often train in a plane that is permitted, permitted to fall for short periods. So they know what it's like to feel weightless. Astronauts learning to pilot a spacecraft experience is almost like being in space. And astronauts train hard to be in top physical condition. Uh, the multi-axial chair, it allows that astronaut to react to the rocket, begins to rotate on itself. So look at what it does. I mean, I was in one of those um, when, I, when I was much younger, like a teenager, um, just to kind of see what it's like, but it was like a standing one, but it's definitely an interesting feeling. So they're really, they really um, prepare astronauts so that they know what to experience when they're in space. And so it says leaving the earth in a rocket is not easy. Astronauts prepare themselves for leaving the journey in the special vehicle. So the centrifuge is at full speed and in the cabin, astronauts experience the same sensation as when the rocket takes off and when it enters the atmosphere. So the astronaut is sitting in a chair that is identical to the one in his future rocket. So these are all preparations. 
And so we also have um, the astronaut suit. So it says there's no atmosphere in space to block the sun's harmful rays. It is very cold or hot, so there is no air to breathe. So the spacesuit is designed to protect the astronauts from these dangerous conditions. Sometimes it takes them an hour to get dressed. So better use the restroom before. Okay, so there is an astronaut there. So the helmet protects the astronaut's eyes from the strong rays of the sun. Um, there's a microphone for speaking with the other atmosphere or the other astronauts. They have cameras on either side to capture and transmit images. Lights on either side help the astronaut see what's ahead. Um, it says buttons control oxygen and electricity to communicate with other astronauts. There's a drill, mini workbench and tool rack. They have a backpack with all that's needed to survive several hours in space, plus a jet pack for getting around. Notebook, thick gloves, boots attached to the pants, drill. Spacesuit is very thick, approximately 10 layers protect the body. The astronaut suit includes undergarments covered with small tubes that circulate cold water um, to avoid overheating. So uh, they have like cooling tubes in there. It also is kind of a diaper if needed for long spacewalks. Sensors on the skin monitor the astronaut's heartbeat. So they have rings for attaching the steel cable to secure astronauts during spacewalks, as well as tools, a bag, or a camera. So all of the parts of the astronaut spacesuit are definitely important um, for one purpose or another. So we're going to look at some of the rockets. It says rocket engines are immensely powerful and able to propel the vehicles far above the Earth. We first use these vehicles to launch satellites and then animals into space before sending human beings. So we've got all these. So the first one was um, the, the Russian one, the Semyorka rocket in 1957, and it says Yuri uh, Gagarin was the first man in space. He traveled Votosk rocket in 1961, and the first woman was Valentina Tereshkova in 1963. So they also had our first passenger rockets um, in, let's see here. So in 1957, we had Like at the Dog. 1959, Miss Baker the Monkey. Um, in 1963, Felicet, the cat, and in 1981, um, a jellyfish. So we have Saturn Apollo program, United States, 1969. Um, this was 363 feet tall. This uh, other one was 101 feet. Um, so it says the enormous rocket carried humans to the moon for the very first time. Um, so this is part of the reason I like to show you this. It's got the different parts. So up here we have the astronauts, a nose cone, third stage, second stage, first stage, and then the main engines. So the three astronauts fit right up there. So when you look at um, that 363 feet, uh, that's what it's broken down into. Space Shuttle Columbia here, um, 1981 to 2003, this is one of our space shuttle disasters. Um, where all of the those people aboard did pass away um, when this uh, space shuttle broke up going back into Earth's atmosphere in 2003. Uh, it says the launcher propelled a manned shuttle like that, like a plane was able to return to Earth. So we have our main fuel tank, booster rockets um, or boosters help the spacecraft lift off. We have the orbiter. So you can see where the cockpit is, satellites, right there. Today, several countries are working together to build rockets. Every week, a rocket takes off somewhere in the world, carrying humans, equipments, or satellites into space. European space travelers are called astronauts, and those from Russia are called cosmonauts. The word astronaut is used to describe men and women who travel into space. So this one is um, the Long March. It's uh, the Chinese, a Chinese rocket. So Chinese astronauts are called Taikonauts. Uh, this rocket is from India, 19, or 144 feet. 
India is one of several countries who have built rockets that can travel to space. So there's a satellite in there. Um, first stage of this rocket is able to land, deploying a kind of landing gear, and the goal is to one day be able to recover and reuse the rocket. So this is the Falcon 9 from the United States, 180 feet tall. And inside here, it's got a satellite. And then the Vega rocket um, from 2012 and 98, it's a European rocket. It's a miniature rocket that launches satellites. So there's satellites in there. So we also have the spaceship um, one. It's a space plane. It's able to fly to space at an altitude of more than 60 miles and return to Earth. So will tourists, you know, start to go to space? Would you go to space if you could? I don't know if I would. I don't know. So when they launch into space, um, it says attention uh, launching into space. Um, so it says the attention final countdown: ten, nine, eight, seven. Ignition of main engine: six, five, four. Firing thrusters stages. Three, two, one. We have liftoff. The rocket soars above the clouds, and then the booster engines are cast away, and in three minutes, the rocket reaches space. The rocket jetsons its nose cone, and then it stages. Less than 30 minutes after landing, its satellites or manned capsules assume an object a orbital trajectory, and so begins the long journey around the Earth or further into space. So we have all these parts here that help it go into space. So really, it, they're meant to, to break apart. You see the different parts here? So we've got the manned spacecraft up here. It orbits, we've got stage three. It's like stage two, stage one with the thrusters. So those do like all come apart until it gets to certain parts here. Oops, sorry, I gotta back up a little. Um, so sometimes it has the launch of Arian 5 that contains two satellites. You can see that. So they, they all kind of, like I said, they all kind of break off. But, you know, we have to have rockets to, to get them up into space. All right, let's look at the next one. So the International Space Station. Um... It's a Soyuz spacecraft that's approaching. It's going to dock at the International Space Station, or the ISS. Six astronauts of different nationalities continuously at work in this large structure, which is just stationed 240 miles above Earth. So, you know, when astronauts go out there, they are tethered. Uh, it's kind of a spaceport where different types of vessels dock, including man capsules and cargo ships, with supplies of food and equipment. So then they can connect here. Um, we've seen a lot of these images, like them eating, playing music. Okay, and we can, here is um, like the Russian module. Somebody tethered so they can go out and do work. Um, they study, you know, plant and do things like how plants live in space. Um, so they have a robot arm for uh, clasping and moving modules or assisting astronauts on spacewalks. Uh, the ISS orbits the Earth 16 times per day, so it goes around that Earth. Pretty interesting. So you know the Earth view from space. We've, we've talked about that. And we definitely have all of these satellites orbiting in space as well. Okay, there's our solar system, which we know about. See, I'm not reading all of this. Okay, Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Those are our inner planets. I still have students that um, were getting those wrong, so make sure that, that you know those that order. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And there's our asteroid belt. Okay, so it's talking about landing on the moon and Mars. Mars, we know we have a rover that's gone there. So we can learn about Mars. Milky Way is our galaxy. I like this. 
So we have a spiral galaxy um, and it rotates on its center and has spiral shaped arms. Um, so in this arm that the solar system and the earth are located visible. So there we are. Um, in the right visible in the night sky, the Milky Way resembles a whitish band as if milk was being spilled. There's different kinds of galaxies too. Spiral galaxy, antenna galaxy, Andromeda galaxy, tadpole galaxy, triangulum galaxy, cartwheel galaxy, lots of different kinds of galaxies. We don't need to know about all of them, um, but it is good to know that we're part of the Milky Way. And that is it. So, um, and like I said, I wanted to share this book with you because I think it has a lot of really great um, extras about space. So I hope that you learned something from reading it. That's all for me. Take care. Peace.